like the more training we get and the more safety certifications we get and the smarter we get, we are not able to make a significant impact on the rate at which people get hurt on our job sites. So we said we need to do something different and we need to go after the culture at more of a base level. And we said, how do we do that? Do we pick a job? Do we try and improve a job and roll that out? Or we do something that we've really never done before. We said, what if we went after a trade? So we said, you know, who touches all aspects of a project? You know, from putting up the site fence through punch list. Um, you know, we need somebody who's forward thinking. We need somebody who's innovative. And we said, well, the carpenters really always seem to be maybe probably the most progressive trade. And they're kind of the tip of the spear when things start to ripple through the, uh, the New York construction industry. So Joe Byrne and I called John Sheehy from the carpenters, from the District Co uh, Council of Carpenters. And we explained to him what we wanted to do. And John just said, that's it. I'm all in. When can we meet next week? And this was about two months ago. And John, thank you for taking this on. That, started, that triggered a series of meetings, and we said, you know, how, how do we really make this? How do we really make this happen? What does the composition of the event look like? Well, first, what are we trying to do? So, we said we need to get we need to go after culture really at a, at a, at a base level. And what's the culture that we're trying to get to? That's a culture of zero harm. I don't know if anybody has heard that term before. That, that, that that's our end game. Zero harm means. Nobody loses a day of work because of an injury. Zero harm means that nobody has a recordable incident on a job site. Zero harm means that nobody has an incident on a job site. Nobody gets hurt at all. Whoever shows up for work in the morning goes home the same way they do at night. That's what zero harm means. That means everybody that comes to work for me or comes to work for anybody in this room, it's under our care and custody Gives, goes home safe. And this is kind of a shift. Um, until we all acknowledge the fact that everybody that works for us is under our care, then we're probably not gonna get to where we're gonna get to. So we have some special guests that I'd like to, I, I've, uh, I'd like to lead with a couple of thank yous this morning. First, I'd like to thank the District Council of Carpenters. You guys have been great teammates and great partners. We would not have this event if it wasn't for you. You guys really drove this thing and we appreciate your support and we appreciate your leadership. Special shout out, um, Joe Geiger, Mike Cavanaugh, Eddie McWilliams, uh, Paul Caperso, you guys were awesome. John, thank you very much. Again, this wouldn't have happened without you. We have OSHA here today. Uh, we've got um, Mitchell Conka and Janet Dragowski. Janet's gonna be one of our panelists today. We really appreciate your time to be here and help us take a stand for safety. Councilman Ben Kalos is going to be here shortly. For those, for the couple of people in the room who don't know him, and I'm guessing it's a very small list, Ben is the guy that really drove Local Law 196, Local Law 204, and 206 across the finish line. So when Ben gets here you know, in advance, thank you for taking a stand for safety and thank you for your help in making our work sites safer. Um, Lee Zaretsky, we needed the perspective of a contractor on our steering committee to make this happen. And when we were sitting around trying to figure out who do we want to help us, we said, okay, we want somebody who's a little forward thinking, we want somebody who has a very good safety record, and we want somebody who walks the talk. And immediately, everybody sitting across the table from us on, from the uh, district council said, oh, Lee Zaretsky of Ronsko. And Lee, your, your input during the planning was critical. We wouldn't be here today, again, without your perspective. So thank you very much. Your comments are thought-provoking. I think everybody here is gonna, be, is gonna benefit from what you have to say when we get to the panel. And then last but not least, I wanna thank all of our panelists that I haven't mentioned so far, Doug Cooper, our moderator, Brooke Amurga, um, Tom Scanlon, and Pete Bennett. Thank you very much in advance for your time. So to get things started, we went back 18 months and we wanted, we wanted to see what did the statistics look like on Turner Jobs for Carpenters. And what we found was over the last 18 months, we had 163 injuries for Carpenters on Turner projects. So to break that down, 
102 of those incidents were non-recordable incidents. So those are basic first aid type incidents. So if somebody gets banged up, they go, but they're able to go right back to work. 61 of those incidents were recordable incidents. Something more than base, basic first aid. That could be stitches, it could be a broken bone, it could be something a little more severe than that, but somebody really got hurt. Of the 61, 30 of those were lost time incidents. Well, let me, I just want to show you a chart. So nine people lost three, like three days or less. 14 people were out for more than three days. One at 10 plus, two at 30, two at 40, and two at 65 plus. The longest one was out 340 days and counting with no return to work day in sight. Now, when I sit up here and say we had a lost time incident, that sounds a little sterile, but the reality is when someone has a lost time injury, that means they've been hurt, and they've been hurt badly enough that they cannot return to work until the doctor clears them. That means that they're sitting home. It might impact their ability to be a wage earner for their household in the future. It means they don't get a paycheck for the days that they're sitting home. I mean, this is very personal. We, when you're talking about numbers and statistics, it's easy to depersonalize it. But that's really what we need to think about. Somebody, 30 people got hurt severely enough on our jobs that they were not able to return to work the next day. And that's what we want to make go away. That ties back to zero harm. Nobody signs up to put themselves in harm's way on our projects. And everybody has the right to expect that they're going to work in a, I'm going to say, a, a risk-free environment. We, there are risks, but we need to figure out how to take those risks away. And that's going to be the subject of much discussion when we get to the panel. So in summary, we had 163 people get injured in the last 18 months on our job, and our work is not done until that number is zero. So when I walk on a job site, I really rely on three things to keep me safe. First and foremost, I, I rely on me. I need to be self-aware of what's going on around me. But I also rely on the project team, and the project team is accountable for providing an environment that lets people work safe. That means we're well lit, that means the floors are clean, that means the sidewalk sheds are up, the engineer controls are in place, that means barricades, that means perimeter protection, stairwells, handrails, guardrails, all that stuff. And then the third thing is I rely on my teammates. Even if I'm on a job every single day, the landscape of a construction site changes from day to day. When I show up at a job, there might be a new risk that I'm not aware of. Hopefully my teammates are telling me. When we're walking around the job, I'm trying to be as present as I can, but I'm also relying on people to look after me. In return, I look after them. So there's no secret sauce here, okay? What we need to do, active caring, we need to be present to everything that's going on around us. We need to have a well-planned site, and we need to have well-planned daily plans before we go to work in the morning. Ben Callis is a big advocate for that, and Jill Byrne and Ben are going to both talk about that a little later in our presentation. So with that, thank you again for coming today. I think we have a pretty good presentation planned. There is time at the end for questions and answers. As Paul said, we want everybody to participate. This is not supposed to be a lecture. This is supposed to be an interactive forum. We need to help each other get to the best solution. Again, zero harm to our carpenters. So thank you very much, and I hope everybody had a good morning. And Ben, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Mitch Conco. I'm with the United States Department of Labor, OSHA. I've been with the agency for 20 years here in Manhattan. Uh, many of you are very familiar to me, so it's good to be here. I'd like to thank Turner and the New York City District Council of Carpenters for having OSHA come in. Um, this meeting is linked directly to OSHA's mission uh, of using a balanced approach uh, to, to provide worker safety and health. And the balanced approach is both enforcement and compliance assistance outreach cooperative programs. Uh, 
you know, the construction industry, contractors, labor unions, OSHA, OSHA and other government, governmental agencies, um, and the stakeholders in the construction world um, are making progress to get to zero harm, uh, but there's still work that needs to get done. Um, things like the pre-task plans, job hazard analysis, uh, the training, all of that is key to getting everybody to work together. Um, it is a team effort, it's all the workers, it's all of the contractors, it's all of the industry, governmental agencies working together to get to this zero um, incident, zero harm uh, area. Um, OSHA is using a balanced approach to address workplace safety and health. Uh, enforcement and compliance assistance complement each other. We are uh, continuing to conduct inspections to enforcements in calendar year 19 up to October 31st. OSHA has conducted over 500 construction site inspections in New York City with another 270 or so um, in general industry. We've had 12 fatalities at construction sites this calendar year so far with approximately 120 incidents. Um, we're using all the tools in our OSHA bag for enforcement. We're responding to these incidents, we're responding to fatalities, we're responding to referrals, complaints, and we're also using our programmed, uh, emphasis programmed targeting um, approach to deal with and address safety and health concerns at construction sites. Uh, focusing on the focus four, there's a trenching emphasis program, there's a falls emphasis program. We use a local targeting emphasis program uh, which targets areas um, where we have historically had high incidents, injuries. Um, a lot of this is occurring in the smaller construction sites in the outer boroughs. Um, we've conducted about 45% of our construction inspections um, at being programmed. So we're going into areas trying to find these construction sites that are not um, looking at zero harm, that aren't following the rules, that aren't doing the training, that aren't inspecting and doing pre-task plans. That's where a lot of our focus is. Um, but we're also continuing to work with contractors using the cooperative programs like VPP, like alliances, doing outreach, working together with industry like today um, to enhance worker safety and health, to eliminate incidents, to eliminate accidents, to eliminate fatalities, to get to zero harm or zero incidents, to make sure all workers go home every day in the same shape that they came to the job site. So OSHA is very happy to be here. It'll, it's going to be in the panel, so that'll be a great thing. We can talk again. Um, we look forward to working with contractors, with Turner, with the Council of Carpenters, with other unions, other associations, other stakeholders in getting to that zero harm or eliminating um, incidents, accidents, and addressing hazards at construction sites. Thank you for having OSHA here and look forward to the rest of their program. Good morning. Good morning. One more time, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you to uh, Turner for hosting this and my brothers and sisters in the Carpenters. Uh, in particular to uh, Joseph Geiger, your Executive Secretary Treasurer, and Michael Kavanaugh, your VP. Can we give them a round of applause for their leadership? <laughs> I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos. I'm a union side labor lawyer. I, uh, before being in the City Council, I had the opportunity to uh, represent our brothers and sisters in the Mason tenders as well as in the operating engineers at one point on the Delphi bankruptcy. And on the city council, I've been focused on construction safety. As we build our city, how do we build it safer? I'm the author of Local Law 78, which would, which 
now is in effect and requires uh, the Department of Buildings and uh, construction companies to count every single life on a construction site and every single injury. Uh, it introduces steep fines if you don't do so. Uh, I'm also, and in so doing, I'm hoping we get a clearer picture of what's happening on construction sites and what's leading to these injuries. You can actually pull the report from DOB and it's very detailed and explains a lot of what happened, why, who, what, where, and it's incredibly interesting. Uh, I was also a sponsor of Local Law 196 for the site safety training, which we'll be talking more about. Local Law 204 for the pre-shift uh, safety meetings and Local Law 206 for the site safety orientations and refreshers. Uh, just speaking globally in the city council, uh, we do a lot of work as a government and we provide a lot of subsidies for a lot of different construction projects, whether it's 421A, J51. I actually have the opportunity to chair a committee where all we did was give away city property to developers for a dollar, and then we would give subsidies on top of it between, in my district, zero, but in some districts, a million dollars per unit. And uh, then I would ask them, are the people who are going to be doing this work going to be able to even afford to live in this affordable housing? And more often than not, the answer I heard is they're gonna get paid the minimum wage, which they improperly refer to as the living wage, which it is not. Uh, the minimum wage pays people about $28,000 a year, and quite often we were building affordable housing for people making $80,000 a year. So we were actually making the crisis worse. And when I asked people about whether or not their workers might have health insurance, the, often, the answer was uh, frequently, they'll get workers comp. And uh, even if they themselves had health insurance. And when I asked them about training, uh, the reality is that people who cut your hair uh, have more training than a lot of folks on the city subsidized construction site. So one of the things I'm looking to see is that on any city subsidized project that the people who build it can, won't even need that affordable housing and will have the training and the on-the-job training that they need to uh, be safe. Uh, and then I'm now the chair of the contracts committee. We actually do $17 billion in contracts every single year. And we're looking to make sure that when we have contracts over a million dollars, uh, that we see apprenticeship on those programs uh, and prevailing wage where possible. So that's a little bit about where I'm going. And in all honesty, my thought is just, if I'm gonna have work done at my home, if I'm gonna go to a doctor, if I'm gonna go to a dentist, whatever it is, I'm not gonna pay that person $15 an hour. I want to get the best quality for the best value and you can't get that at minimum wage. So thank you for having me. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Just going to show you a quick video from the, the district council we thought was interesting, called 212.
everybody. My name is Joe Byrne. I'm one of the operations managers for Turner New York, and I thought we would show that video. I saw it when I went to the Carpenters Training Facility in Las Vegas, which was a very, very impressive place. So I want to thank the District Council, inviting uh, Cagney, uh, some of our Cagney members, Ray McGuire and Asa, were with us, and we were very impressed when we saw that video. The reason why um, we showed you that was we have a little bit of an ask today, and the ask is, um, I'm going to ask you a question first. How many people in this room really know what a PTP is? And I don't, I, I can raise your hand if you want, but I guarantee, I guarantee not everyone in this room really, really knows and understands what a PTP is, a pre-test plan. So the council member ex explained Local Law 204, it's been in our program for, in our Bill Life program for a couple of years now about doing pre-test planning, but now it's law. And we did, you know, if you know Turner, and you, you know we're very, uh, we collect paper, we collect stats, we do stats on everything to try to understand, to try to be better. And what we did was, we found that uh, one of the keys to success, the road to zero, when trades didn't get hurt at all, they had a great PTP, Everybody in the crew understood what was going on in and around them that day, and everybody went home the same, if not better than the, day, the way they showed up to work. So we did a, a, a uh, Doug Cooper and his team did a sort that took a hundred of those incidents where people, people got hurt at work. Took a hundred of those incidents, and then took the PTPs for each one of those incidents. 75, 75 of the 100 incidents where people got hurt, the activity was not on the PTP. The activity was not on the PTP. What we also found is that if 25% uh, of them was, the reason why is the PTP was done really well. It was done really, really well. But at one of them, I'll tell you an example, one of them was they had pre-cut all, it was a car, you know, we're just talking car to say, they pre-cut all these studs for a long run of a wall. When they got towards the end, they were short about a dozen studs. So one of the carpenters doing the right thing, ran to get the chop saw, came back, did the old, let me cut the whole bundle, you know, turn the old head and let the sparks fly. Spark hit the wall, rebound, hit him in the eye, and he's been out for quite some time. They were doing the right thing, the PTP was excellent, but it didn't have the chop saw, the face shield that should have been used when they went and cut that. And the, the, the carpenter and the foreman were trying to just finish the day out and do the right thing. But when that video talked about going a little extra further, going a little second more, trying a little harder, the idea is if we try to follow these rules of the PTPs, you will make a difference. How many people in this room have attended their company, their foreman's PTP? Raise your hand. I'd say it's about 50% to 75% not enough. I learned something when I was, I was at, um, at a, a conference uh, last week where they drew an hourglass. And in the hourglass on the top, they put the owners of companies. And at the, 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 squeeze, at the squeeze board, at the vortex, they, they put the foreman. And at the bottom, they put us. Turner, the GCs, the CMs. And they said so much pressure is on the foreman to get done on time, to get, done, get it done right, get it done once, that a lot of times, safety becomes second to get it done first. And there's a fine line that we need, and Lee's gonna talk a little bit about it later. We, we singled out Lee, and he'll talk about that later. But, and we're not, we don't like to look at people getting hurt as far as money. We, we, we don't like to compare that. That's not Turner's goal, that's not the district council's goal. The district council and Turner's goal is that people go home the same way they showed up, or better than they showed up that day to work, or better. And our goal to collectively together is explained as our road to zero. And we found the best way in a crew 
for the crew to not have an incident is to have a PTP and have a PTP that's done correctly. I had some examples I was showing. One of the PTPs up here were, I forgot what it was, it says like, uh, 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 plum, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the plumbers, they're not here. It says plumbing, and the, the activity was doing plumbing work. And it said where? In building. Do you think that's a good PTP or a bad PTP, right? So the idea is drilling down, going the extra mile, making an example, and make an example of yourselves. The ask of us today is that everybody in this room, whether you're with a company, you're with Turner, you're with the district council, you're, you're a foreman, you're a safety manager, attend a PTP. Understand what it is. I, I had to go to Des Moines, Iowa to understand what a real good PTP was. And I witnessed electricians doing a PTP. He went through, the foreman first went through the activities of the day, then each one in the crew went and put a ha hazard or a mitigation method on the board. They all had to do it, and they all wanted to do it. And at the end of the, the, the half hour that they did this PTP, it was done phenomenal. It was done phenomenal. And Chris and Philly and I asked the most senior guy in the crew, which is a German, what do you think it is? And he goes, well, the work is valuable to me, and I don't want to miss work. And I have, you know, uh, I, I, I'm the breadwinner for my family. And if you guys care enough for me to spend a half hour each day before I work to make sure I don't get hurt, then who, I'm the fool if I don't listen, if I don't participate, if I don't, I'm not part of the program. So yeah, why not? He goes, I, we go, what do you think is the difference between Iowa and New York? I go, well, a lot of difference. There's much more corn there, by the way, than here. But what he said was that maybe we think, you know, that we're New York, we're better, you know, we're smarter, we're always bigger, everything's all this good stuff. But the reality is, it's an attitude change. And it's an attitude change. We're asking you to show your foreman, to show up to the PTP, and explain to them and participate in it, and explain to them why it's important. It makes a difference. Thank you very much. We're going to ask a couple of people to come up right now. We're going to have a, we're going to have a panel session. Um, we're, the, we're going to ask for a lot of Q and A, uh, and we really we're going to ask for some participation from the crowd for some questions and answers. So Doug is going to be a, 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 a mediator. We're going to turn it over to him. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. Tell us what your role is 
and what your influence or what your uh, how that role connects with workplace safety. All right, so Tom, we'll start with you. My name is Tom Scanlon, uh, health and safety instructor for the council of training. I teach apprentices and journeyman upgrade and uh, getting ready to take some site safety courses as well. <laughs>
it's constant vigilance that uh, that really makes it successful. Complacency is the enemy to it all. And that's everything from choosing topics, uh, weekly toolbox talks, pertinent on the job safety, off the job safety, not being a safety cop would even I show up on the job. I used to show up and want to pull people down and throw people off the fire for not. Instead, I'll have a little talk, I'll pull them down, I'll take a couple of minutes to explain to them, you know, show them a picture of a, a nail in someone's eye and just ask them about their family. And it's that one second of that shortcut, you know. True. So that's an interesting approach, right? When you're kind of getting, making it very personal. Yeah, the other way wasn't working, so uh, we had to change. And it, it's all about change and coming up with new ways. A place that's easy to have. So, Peter, how about the uh, district? Well, we, um, we take the training very seriously. So we train the apprentices, we train the apprentices to understand that safety is part of their job. It's a skill set. We, we approach it as a skill set. It's not just something to do. It's something to actually be skilled at, to look at a job, to understand the hazards of it. Uh, it's almost like a self-check, right? Self-explain. What do I need? Uh, safety glasses. Um, chops on. I need face shield also, you know, double eye protection, hearing protection, you know, so they need to look at the tasks at hand, so we try to bring that to the forefront in our training. This is end of the members. Great, thank you. So Tom, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce back to you for a second. What do you think are some of the biggest obstacles that we have to, that prevents us from having the, the culture and safety that we have on our projects and in the industry? Scheduling. Scheduling's a big one. Companies and foremans and all that have to have a little bit of foresight. <clears throat> they need to think out basically what am I going to be doing tomorrow? What am I doing in a week's time? Right? What are my obstacles that I might have? Do I have the proper equipment that might be needed to do that job in a day or a week's time? <clears throat> um, in that area. What are the trades going to be working with? Maybe I need to coordinate with the, we didn't build the schedule, but maybe we can adjust it a little bit so that I'm not in another trade's way or they're not in my way uh, on that area. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's basically having that material where you need it. Right? It's going to save down in that area. Uh, five minutes of planning your work, you're doing what you're going to do tomorrow, the next week, or the next month. It save you hours or man hours at the end of the day. Remember, it doesn't take longer for work to save right? in that area. That end of the, end of the day, that will save you. Have that so I'm going to open that question up to the rest of the panel as well. What do you think are some of the obstacles that prevent us from achieving that, that zero harm type of culture that we're looking for? I can back up to what Tom was sharing. It's the unforeseen event or circumstance that happens in a day, in and around the schedule, like we heard about the one incident where the person was trying to just get it done the last bundle of studs. Those things that probably couldn't or were included in the PTP. Stuff happens, you know, and schedule in my opinion these days. We're trying to do more and delays and things like that, and they're getting it done and trade stacking and working on top of people. Everyone's doing their best, but you know, things come up in a day and we're tight and confined spaces. So uh, it's challenging out there and we just we just gotta pause and think big through. Joe? Yeah, so we were fortunate enough to have a couple of Green Berets um, uh, visit with us with our veterans group and we were able to take them for a tour of Javits with Craig and uh, up in 66 Hudson. And they were able, <coughs> they gave a safety talk to the raising gangs on the job and a bunch of the other trades on the job. And they explained what they do as far as if someone is not prepared, they don't have their proper PPE on, they use a different term, they pull them off the line, send them back to the, the tent, to the camp, whatever. And I heard, and I'm gonna use Lee as an example. Lee used the same terms when we were talking with him a few weeks ago preparing for today's meeting. Lee said, my supers and private men hate when I show up to, to the job site, right? They hate when Lee shows up. He's the owner, they hate when he shows up. Because he saw somebody on top of the left standing on the rail. He pulled him down and sent him to the shanty. And he said, wait there for me. When I get back, I'll talk to him. And walked around the rest of the job. It's Lee told me, which had stuck out of my mind. <laughs> and that work that's had to sit in the shanty while everybody else is still working. So now he's felt kind of like I'm not part of the crew anymore. And the Green Parade told us the same thing. 
And so when he made that impression on the person who didn't have all his gear right, that his complacentness could hurt somebody else, he'd never do it again. And then I heard Lee talk about it. He said the same thing when he sent him to the shanty, wait for me, I'll finish my walkabout, checking on things, and back to the shanty. He sat there for an hour, hey, I don't have to do anything, I'm leaving easy. It wasn't, it was the exact opposite. He said, wow, I'm not part of the crew. The guy's gonna think I'm a schlepper, because Lee told me to sit in the shanty, then Lee came and talked to me about why he's standing on top of the left, it's unsafe. If you fall, it's not only, I lost the one hour, so it's a choice of losing one hour, of you sitting in the shanty not being productive walk, you fall off that left, everybody stops. Everybody goes, has some strength to get you to, to, you know, you hurt your arm, whatever it is, get to the medic, this and that. And then suddenly you use, you lose hours with the whole group, as opposed to one hour with the guy going to the shanty because he wasn't prepared. The way he was acting not properly. And I thought the two were, the, the, they were very similar to me, and they stood out to me. And I don't know if anybody here in the room has went as an owner or, or a business manager or a turner person and stopped somebody from doing something that was unsafe. You see it, you know, you stop. And that stopping is a small task, maybe you lose five minutes, 10 minutes, a half hour, you introduce yourself, you're polite about it, you explain to them why it's wrong, you explain to them why you care about them, and you say to them, please try, we want you to go home as to say, we keep repeating ourselves the same way you showed up or better. How many people in this room have done that? You don't have to raise your hand and answer me, but inside yourself, I guarantee more than 75% of people in this room, the answer is no. And our ask again today is it to be yes, 100%. That's where we're at. Okay. Yeah, I would like to interject in there in that in the Manhattan office, we have a lot of I don't think that we're having that reluctance for people to stop the work. 
to be frank, I think some of the guys don't want to ruffle, you know, the waters. Okay. They just, you know, don't think that it's going to be welcome. And I'll tell you from the contractor's point of view, sometimes general contractors, not Turner, who don't work for them, they don't want to hear it. Just get it done, you know, and that's, that's a, it's a, a factor. And or if they do bring it to their attention, they're not necessarily going to do anything about it. So we take it within our own power to wait until that area or the situation's remedied before we'll go to work there. The, um, I agree. The hurry up and get it done attitude is definitely a problem. Safety complacency is like toilet work as well. You know, all I gotta do to water the lawn is wash the car, you know, that type of thing. Um, if you plan, and even in the schedule, in the schedule of it, you actually plan for unforeseen events correctly, hopefully you'll never have to use that. You might actually come out ahead at the end of your schedule if you get through it with the zero harm, you know, if your, your job goes well. But that's definitely, uh, I agree with you. Scheduling um, definitely needs to be addressed on um, every topic in order for it to be a safer culture. I think that the common thought of it's going to cost, you know, needs to be dismissed as well. Because we found by doing the proper safety planning, pre cast planning, it's getting everyone in the mindset of having the right tools, the equipment, the materials there, and just thinking out the process of the day ahead of them, it'll actually increase productivity if done properly. Yeah. Also, Having the right personnel, right? The personnel that's going to be doing your job with a task that that's going to be at hand. Somebody that's not uh, comfortable going in a sizzle lift is not going to be the most productive person, right? So you need to choose the right personnel and also make sure that the personnel that you're using is also have what? The proper training in the task that's going to be done or the safety devices or the things that you're going to be using in order to complete the task. I'm going to interject there. So I, I know.
You know, it was interesting when, uh, when Mitch was speaking earlier today, he, he said three things. One, he talked about enforcement and compliance, and then your cooperative program. Right? So that the enforcement is one thing, but in the absence of compliance, the enforcement aspect of it is it, it's not it's not effective. Right? And three, well, you know, you always get people who are exposed, and that's usually in their pocket, right? So owners, employees who are picked up Safety. If your EMR is above one, 
or if your uh, safety record sucks, for a lack of a better word, you don't have the opportunity to bid that work. Uh, and that's just not that's not just a Turner policy. That's some of the owners that we work for, like Petition Aspires and NYU's and all the other owners that we work for, that ask us, show us the safety records of these subcontractors, right? And it starts when we're setting fitness. And then it moves on to the uh, uh, bid process. When we're having scope review meetings at any stage, we start with safety. And our culture has, has changed a little bit. You know, just a few years ago, we would say, if you got safety, check, move on to the scope, move on to the schedule. We're a little bit more detailed now. We want to talk to you about how you plan on performing that work. Are you wearing Kevlar sleeves? Are you wearing cut resistant gloves? Are you following all our DHS <coughs> policies? And then on top of that, how do you think you're approaching this particular work? That's how we have to start, and that's how we're talking about leadership and caring. That's where it needs to start. And all the way to the award, we're, we're using uh, what we call the best value matrix now. I've heard a lot of complaints from some people here, and a lot of good things that came out of it. What that means is, it's not just the lowest bidder that gets awarded the work. It's based on safety, financial records, all your ability to perform work, and price. So safety is considered in getting awarded work. And that's not just coming from us, that's coming from our clients, like Petition Squires, NYU, Bernardo. They all look at our best value matrix, and the first thing that's on there is safety record and your approach to building that particular job and that so, so beginning those conversations at the very beginning of the process is is important. Important. Pre-qualification. Safety is a huge component to getting even pre-qualified before you even get on, getting on that list of the pick one. Hundred percent correct. Right. That's where it starts, and, and setting the goal starts there. And even before procurement, with Sandy and, and the estimating team, it starts there when we're figuring a job. We have the factor, just like everyone said on the panel, factor safety into the schedule, factor safety into our wrestlers, and that's, that's where it really needs to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to shift back to uh, regulation and enforcement. You know, we, uh, we are building in New York right now, and that is probably one of the most heavily regulated environments that we can in. Uh, and as we talk about that, how do we better equip ourselves in order to be effective builders in that heavily regulated world? And that's a tough question. So I'm going to open it up to anybody who wants to start the conversation. Well, we need to stay uh, abreast of all the new rules and regulations, the new laws. Uh, we need to make sure that on our end, that our instructors um, are trained to the highest level so we can apply the training. So being aware, um, being aware and staying on top of the topics as they come, and that will help will motivate the industry. Best practices, you know, what we're doing here today, <coughs> staying on touch with uh, the latest technology, wearables, we're here and we're seeing helmets. It's just like everything else, we're just constantly raising the bar, you know, as, as we're learning. You know, we don't know today what we don't know, right? And as incidents and things happen, like think about what happened with the first crane incident and what that turned out to be. And now the 196 came out of past experience. So, you know, it'll continue to evolve. And uh, we just got to stay vigilant on the forefront of it. Complacency is the other. And, and, and if you look at like local law 196, as CAGNI members, you know, that we were a competent person and talked about the PTP. And Depending on how you read it and look into it, right, Charlie? Who, who is the competent person? Should that competent person have 62 hours? As a company, Turner, we felt that anybody that could be in that area, ourselves, we trained all of our superintendents, whether they're assistant, project, uh, straight supers, safety managers, we decided to have them all have a 62. And as CACI members, we also put out a memo saying something of the effect that felt that it could be true grade in five, we got a lot of pushback from that. And I had a bunch of talks with Joe Geiger and the district council about it, and I said, if you're able to do it, what, and it's great, you know, if I felt if you, does he really, really have to do it? A little extra safety training is 
never going to be a bad thing. Whether it's, it's borderline or it's a gray area, when in doubt, you should do it. Is it bad to provide extra safety training, the 62-hour OSHA training to your worker? You know, that may prevent one incident. Some of these incidents we see are the, the ramifications are astronomical. The stop work order for 450 workers for 30 days. You know what the dollar amount that is? You know, the worker that never works again. You know what the dollar amount is that is? If you, you can't compare the $6,000 in the train. You can't. So, in our eyes, when in doubt, you should do it. Because, you know, it, 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 it's only a better thing to do. Side on the side of safety, side on the side of more is, is, is okay. It's okay. And that, that's kind of our position. We feel that a little extra safety training goes a long way. Yeah. yeah. Speaking about OSHA, the OSHA 30, that's the bare minimum, right? Doing more is, is not frowned upon, right? Um, and and I'm, yes, we got to say the rest of the latest regulations and all that, but it's about being a continuous learn, right? Or, or to improve. If I told all you guys that by uh, doing something you would make more money, what would you do? You would do it, right? Uh, safety is the same is the same thing. If you did the, the, the extra step and you stop to, to do your PTP or, or plan the work properly to be to be safer, that, that's what it's about. I love the video and I want to actually agree that a little bit. Good is the enemy of great. Yeah. You know, I love all of those little things. And it's true. You just got to keep pushing. Yeah. We have to, and it really is a little bit. I just can't stress that enough. Rich and I see so many employers, you know, we have more instruction out of the Manhattan office than any other office in Region 2. And uh, it's the same thing. Often, somebody has seen a worker working the way they were either, uh, either uh, eventually led to the injury or led to um, a fine or a citation from us, and they didn't address it. And, you know, we know of today, people are more trained generally on most of these large sites for sure. And it's the, um, the general contractors holding the subcontractors accountable. So it really just, and them, in, in fact, holding their you can't cite employees. Uh, so for now, we have to go back to the employer, and it really does start at the top. So we, so we talked about uh, oversight, right? Uh, we talked about compliance, we talked about accountability. So in, in your estimation, who holds the trades accountable for, who's accountable for safety on our job sites? We all are. We all are. Everybody that goes to work every day is accountable. You as the worker, take the millennium that you have today versus the old worker, right? The millennium is always asking why. Why are we doing this? Well, you should be doing this. Right? The old guy is giving a lot. Well, we've been doing this for 20 years. We've given you a pushback, okay? Uh, those two need to what? The young guy might have a good idea. You learn something that's what? Might be better for both of us, right? Work easier, not harder. <laughs> you know, that kind of concept. You know, we've, we've been talking about this whole concept of, uh, I don't think we use the term yet, but how many folks have heard the term active care? You know, behavior-based safety, active care on our job sites. You know, I mean, that's really what it's, what it's really all about. It's not about the regulations as much as it is about, I think mean, the, the, the regulations and the rules kind of provide us the confine. But we have to create an environment where people want to operate and be compliant very much like to see it as good. We would say before, but it's how we speak to each other. Right? Um, so a little empathy goes a long way. A little understanding goes a long way. But that is a two-way street. And we're, we're all involved because there's components to explain the why of it to the people. So there's the buy-in to it. You know? And when we were answering the last question, it's, it's the we. If we do this collaboratively, it'll be effective. If we regulate it, jam it down, or anything like that, to me, you're gonna get people turned off and resentful in the whole process. Yeah, totally. 
but uh, Doug can chime in a little bit more. I think it's important when we say we all are responsible for safety. Yes, I, I, I agree with it, but you got to be a little bit more specific than that, right? Because when I say upstairs that we all are responsible to award this package by a certain date, stuff falls through the cracks because some people are not doing anything about it. Safety starts with the work. Right, the worker has to, has, to be, has to care about himself enough or herself enough to perform that work uh, safely. Uh, it starts with the partner. That partner has to be able to watch out for, for, for their partners. Uh, the business owners and the project managers and the foreman of that company, you have to give those workers the proper training, the proper tools to perform that work correctly. Right? And, and us as Turner, we have to give you the space that is safe, right? Well lit. It's the, it's Floor that's clean so you can perform that work. So you gotta define when you say we all are responsible. Yes, we are. But there's a certain everyone has their responsibility. I, I agree, but it, it also it needs to be exemplified from the top on down. So you can say the yes. worker needs to be the one that cares. But if we're not exemplifying from the top on down, they don't buy it seriously. So that's you know, what I'm yeah. saying. That's one of the things that we need to look at. So when you say from the top on down. Don't walk on the job site wearing your glasses. Right? Don't walk on your job sites from a leadership perspective wearing loafers. Thank you. Right, so we talked about PTPs and the importance of pre-task planning. Uh, you've heard from our panel, so I have a question for the audience. A lot of times we're finding that repetitive work on our job sites result in almost like a cookie cutter PTP. So how can, you know, from an audience perspective, each one of you are engaged in some way, shape, or form in workplace safety within your companies or within your industry. How do you avoid the complacency that might follow in a repetitive pre-task plan? Anybody got any insight to that? How do you keep the worker engaged? Okay. We set up our pre-task plan with two hazards and uh, two uh, solutions. We set up our PPPs with two hazards and two solutions, and every day there are different hazards that we address. The hazards are always addressed to our scope of work. Occasionally, depending on the job, we'll put other things in there. Their fire workers are still building steel, and their road work might be going on. We'll address all of it, primarily two different hazards associated with our work every day and they're always different. I know they're different because we set them up in the office before they go. We set them up and then and give them out to the, the, the project sites or the teams. Right. Right. Any other thoughts? How do we keep the PPPs fresh? Keep people engaged? Tom? Yeah, I think I think the business thing is to get worker engagement. Ask them what went well yesterday what we could have done better, and what they'd like to see differently. Good thoughts. Yes, Can I make one comment on the work on engagement? Another thing that we do is when we have our morning PTPs, our groups, our crews break into groups, and for a, for a while we would do it with a common person, or that team leader would do the PTP. And at one point we decided Let's have every day a different worker in that group, because those groups are together every day. Let's let a different worker give the PTP and get worker involvement from, even an apprentice can give a PTP. And it brings them in and it gives them a sense of ownership of the PTP. So that's a, a, a big part of it, is the participation, not just one guy giving out what it is, having other members of the team participate, and it gives the other people a chance to ask questions and get a little conversation, and uh, it does work. <coughs> Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're talking changes throughout the day, like the report is one place, and you've got to give it somewhere else. And I just think it's a really good idea to uh, spot check the work throughout the day. The crew is doing something that doesn't look safe, you know, to ask those questions with engagement. And maybe it's time for them to stop and redo a new pre-task plan in the middle of the day. There's a living doc right here. Yeah. 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 So we see safety and health plans that are, you know, everybody has them. They're cookie cutter, safety consultants, you can sell them like gray. <laughs> But so the pre-task plan and the job hazard analysis. 
it's great that you have not just a uh, supervisor giving a pretest, but they think all the workers need to know how to do the pretest. So by getting them engaged in that, it's the best uh, way because then if you see something that's missing, you can what? Act and you can actually say, hey, you missed this, why didn't you put that in there? Right, so they're learning at the same time. So now they're understanding how to create a better what? Pretest at the end of the day when it comes their turn or when it's theirs. Right? So they see something that's not right, that's not in the pretest, what are you supposed to do? Stop, let's reevaluate this. Right? You should not continue on. That's a first point that gives everyone the responsibility in their part in the overall plan. Right. That's good. Good right. Good right. Uh, yeah, Connor Prosper from uh, Eastern Billboard. Uh, what resources is Turner giving to the subcontractors as far as the safety is concerned? Like, are your uh, upper management also being trained with PTPs that are now becoming so important for the local law? some of the resources that we're providing? Well, I'll give you a few examples. On our job, we have had PTP training for all the foreman from the technical company who we felt they weren't doing a good enough job. We held it on the deck with about 50 of their workers. We did it for them for free. We also sent, what we're trying to do now, is send our superintendents, mandatory engineers, to the PTP to try to give a second version new set of eyes, a fresh idea to the PTP. But what we find, the reason why we're here today, is we can talk to your workers who we are blue in the face. But if the foreman says, do this, they will do it to the tape. If we say, do this, they'll say, mm, I'll wait for the foreman to tell me. That's why we're asking you to partner with us with this idea of participating in the PTP. Wear the suit with the white hard hat that are heading come to give us a violation. Let's face it, we used to call it no safety, right? We're not the suit with the violation. Our new approach is, is very much engagement and being nice and polite and professional and introducing ourselves. But we found the impact of the super or the foreman to that worker or us to that worker is insurmountable difference. So as much as we can go to the PTP, attend the PTP, show them how to do the PTP, if the importance of the PTP does not come from the employer who hands them the check, the Jacobson check, right? The employer, that says, don't say turn around that check, it's a Jacobson, I'm sorry to use the example. <laughs> <laughs> John Cheney's on the If the employer, the super, the super, in the carpenter's world is the god of the construction site. Pat, don't let your head get that big. He is the man. If Pat went up to the guy and said, that PTP is not good enough, I need you to do it better. I guarantee the next day it'll be 100 times better. I guarantee it. If we do that, maybe it'll be 25% better, but it won't be because we're not the person. Remember I explained to you about the hourglass? The hourglass is the company, the foreman, and then us. And the foreman has the pressure on him. He's got to produce, he's got to make schedule, those four things, schedule and snack. And some, more than not, the safety gets pushed to the bottom. So I gotta make sure I get up 100 feet of wall, I gotta get the top somebody in the day, because the super said I have to do it. If the super showed up and said, this PTP is more important than finish that thousand foot of wall today, I guarantee that PTP will be the best PTP you ever see. But until we get there, that's why we're here today. We explained it to John Sheedy and the district council. They said, we agree, we agree, let's bring them in together and explain to them together the need for the three to get together, not the two. Not the district council and turn. It's the district council, the employer and turn. Until we have the triangle connected, it's not gonna work as good, all right? We need the three to be together. Yes. We're talking a lot about something that we're currently doing. We have to be the whole turn of trade partners in this program. Why don't we all take our, not all of us have contracts currently with turn, but why don't we take our biggest contract that we're currently working on, take it to a permanent job group or a representative from the district council, somebody who wants to go off the job? Great idea. 
job. They're the representatives of the union at the job site. Why uh, not get them involved? Yeah, we do stuff. We also uh, meet with John Sheehy and the council and see as well. We train them to a high level. Um, but yeah, it's made great. I'll tell you as an employer, from my point of view, I welcome anyone who shows an interest. <laughs> and I find that shop stories come in with all the highest level of standards and training and safety safety in particular. And we welcome them. You know, and, uh, and they're usually quite impressed with the level of that we're performing under too. So uh, they fall right into line and they help spread the culture. Hey, doing supervisor training for the last uh, six months uh, in the council, I always ask the question, how many guys have an actual toolbox full? How many guys actually have a pretest? How many guys have their equipment uh, inspection reports? I mean, I'd be surprised. Less than 10. I mean, it's not coming from the top, okay? That's the culture. Thanks. You gotta build that culture. Hey, DOB comes now December 1st, that's what they're gonna be looking for. If you don't have that organized and look like you're doing the right thing, you're gonna have some problems. And owners, don't wait for a shop store to think that they're gonna be your solution to uh, your safety culture problems. Cool. All right. Folks, I just wanna thank you. I wanna thank our panelists. Let's give them a big hand. Charlie Murphy or caring about Turner Construction Company. It's caring about the worker. And if we don't have that caring, we're not going to improve our, our safety culture. Uh, as I think about it, you also brought up the thing that probably, as I think, is our biggest enemy. Uh, among the complacencies, one, definitely, I'm with you on that. The other one is schedule. Schedule. Things constantly change. We work with developers who have to get the tenant in by a certain date, or open the hospital up to start treating patients by a certain date. We're all under a lot of pressure on schedules. Things change. And then that, that PTP that may have made sense at 7 in the morning doesn't make sense at 11 or 2. And I haven't figured out how to solve this by the way. I'm just, I'm aware of it. I'm aware schedule is probably our, our biggest uh, our biggest obstacle. I agree with Janet where she said 99% of accidents are preventable. I'm a big believer in that. I, I don't believe in accidents. I think they're all preventable. And I think that it's part of my accountability to Turner, to you, to the worker, is what are we all doing so that we plan better so those accidents don't happen. I like STAR, Stop, Think, Act, Act, Review. In turn, we have a similar one, 
plan, do, check, adjust. Same concept. See what you're doing. Let's stop and make sure. Is there a way to do it better? Um, so, where, so where are we going? Number one, go back to awareness. We have a problem. It's all of our problems. We care about the work we want to improve it. So that's on, on us. We have a problem. Let's go. Let's go uh, work on it. When you get owners like like Lee, you get labor involved, and they want to train the workers to be uh, be better, to be aware. When the workman who has to do the task has the one the sense to recognize this isn't safe, and two the safe environment to go back to the form and say I shouldn't be doing this. Can we figure out a different way? That's when we're that's when we're going to see our numbers drop. When you have a general contractor who realizes he can't stack the trades because that's unsafe, that's when we're going to have a safer environment. We have an owner who realizes safety is just as important as opening up the hospital. How I think about this like, that Sloan Kettering. We have a lot of reports about Sloan Kettering in a facility that's going to make people better, treat people. It's a health institution. How bizarre is that? Yet they they have deadlines. And at NYU Kimmel, and at New York Presbyterian, and go right around the board. How crazy is that? Um, our, I'll say, our vision, our vision, is we want to, we want to look at the work itself and write down what the worker and the task that they're doing, and what can we, and this is where the foreman really comes into play. What can we do to, by improving the work itself, whatever that task is, we can make it safer. The quality can be better, and if those two things happen, the productivity goes up. But it really goes down to that task that the worker's doing. What are we doing to, to improve the work by observing the work? None of that things, none of those things happen upstairs in my office. None of it happens in this room. It all takes place on the job site where the work is taking place. What are we going to do? So that's kind of that's kind of my mission. We have a couple of experiments that we've started, one at 66 Hudson Boulevard with the, uh, with the uh, right. miscellaneous iron contractor installing curtain wall inbeds. That's where we started. And it's interesting when you start really focusing on the work, the things that, that those crew of iron workers have just to get their, their job done. There's a group of other iron workers over their heads welding studs and slag is coming down. There's things that and we never intended to send them in there to, to experience that, and they shouldn't be working on that condition. Those are the things that happen every day because the, because the steel contractor got a little behind and he's doubling up on his work. But these are things that we have to improve on. We had an experiment at Women's Hospital with Jacobson on drywall installation. And we're running some others. And we're gonna, we want to engage others of you in this room. I know uh, Rogers and Sons is with us on two projects. 66 Hudson Boulevard and Javits. There's definitely room for improvement there, so we, we want to work with Rogers and Sons. But that's kind of that's kind of um, what we're seeing. And I think you all, you guys, captured all of those concepts. It was really, it was really remarkable how uh, what, what you all said really is. I, I think a lot of what we need to do, make us aware of, and how to how to improve. I love the fact that uh, that labor and contractors and GCs are getting together, recognizing that we do have a problem, that there is, that there is, that it's, um, it's just wrong to let it continue, and it's up to us to go fix it. I do love that concept. So we leave the room. I'd love, uh, I'd like to take up on the offer on the PTP. Let's go to a job. Let's go see that PTP, sit down with that crew and see, and, and review it, and see what, what we can do to make it better. What can we make to do, what can we do to make the work they are doing better so it's safer, better quality, more productive, everybody wants. So thank you all for coming. Am I supposed to say that or is Charlie Whitney coming? Charlie Whitney's going to go next. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Ed, come on up and take it away. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you.
insurance clause meeting with the owners and the developers, GC subcontractors. Uh, we're very, very happy to be here today with our subcontractors, all the carpentry subcontractors and the carpenters union. I think all of us have a big commitment, have made a solid commitment. There's a tone at the top that we're going to bring safety uh, and, and the cost of insurance and everything down in New York City. There's also a component, we want to make sure people go home safe, but we talked about that. We have to hit this from many different uh, angles, if you will. And you talked about the recorded incident rates in Los Angeles compared to New York and the EMR. How many people in our industry really knows what an EMR is, what an experience modification rate is, or the recordable uh, incident rate? Very few people, in an industry of 200,000 people, the New York City construction industry, Mostly only the people in the procurement process even knows what that is. So to that end, we thought, and we know, in the last 18 months, we've been on an education mission, if you will, with our members. Uh, when they come to the union for different training courses, but also on the job sites where you might see these signs up. What is the experience modification rate of your employer? What impact does it have on you financially if that EMR goes up? Less work, less work for you if your company can't get a job because their EMR goes up. More work if the EMR goes down. Companies with a low EMR are gonna be sought after in this industry. And we want, with Perna and with our subcontractors, we want to be able to deliver to the owners and developers and end users in New York City safer job sites. That's what, that's what we're doing here. That's why we're making this commitment and investment. We're putting money into it. Uh, but we're going to need your help. We're going to need everybody in this room, all of our contractor associations, all of our subcontractors that we've been in communication with. But we're turning to it. We want to make sure we get this education material, not just when they come in for training, but out on the job site. And it's not enough that I follow the rules, I don't get hurt today, but if somebody else on the job gets hurt, that's going to affect EMR and company. EMR is going to go up. It's going to happen. It's going to impact me. People we know, we want to change attitudes and behaviors. We have to give them the reason why, as Lee said before. When you're a little kid and everybody says, well, that's why, that's where we still are in this industry, right? We want to keep people, uh, people safe, we want to be safe, and just that's why. The guy with the white hat comes around, put, you know, put your hat on for personal protective equipment. Uh, Pre-test planning, let's think about starting to explain to people the industry they work in, why it's important bring those EMRs down. What is an EMR? Let's explain that to, to the workforce out there. We'll do it with the companies, and I think if we're doing it on the job site, I think every trade in the industry is gonna see from the bottom up. So we're getting from the top down, Joe talked about the hourglass, uh, we gotta work from the bottom up too. There's some education at the bottom, what this all means. If you want a career in the construction industry, you gotta be concerned about these EMRs and the recordable uh, incident rate. So that's what we're doing. We're very uh, happy to be here working with Turner and working with our subcontractors. I know we have some of the greatest subcontractors in the city, been in, work, in business for many, many years. Uh, Lee, of course, is uh, more than committed, more than committed to the safety. And it shows in his EMR, which is down around 0.8. Am I right? But we want to get the industry, we want to set those benchmarks. It gives gives our workforce, if we start giving them some goals, some benchmarks that we want to achieve, I think they can meet those achievements, but we got to set those goals and benchmarks, right? Of course, it's zero interest, uh, zero injury rates, but that's what we are. We're very happy to be here. We thank Joe, Gary, and Charlie, and Charlie Whitney, and everybody for uh, putting this together. And we're going to continue every day with our subcontractors and with you to bring these jobs in. Uh, and I know we talked about Rogers, we're using those triax devices up there. And just so you know that the carpenters are very open to all new technologies, to experiment, see what works. At the end of the job, we'll try to modify that. You know, did it reduce injuries? Did it help? If not, we won't use it again. If it does, we'll just expand it, make sure that other subcontractors know about it, and we'll jump on it. So that's where we are. Thank you very much. Training Center will be uh, Peter Bennett, Director of what, Tommy Scanlon. Just meet in the back of the room and we'll lead everybody through. Thank you very much.